I'm Ariel Waldman, and I'm here to talk about hacking space exploration. We can get the slides going. There. So this is one of my favorite images uh, to show when I give talks. It's an image taken by Voyager 1, one of my favorite spacecrafts that's going to the outer reaches of our solar system and beyond. And if you can see that tiny little pale blue speck of a pixel there, that's Earth as seen from about 4 billion miles away. So that's where you can find me if you need me. But in all seriousness, why I really love images like these is because they really encapsulate how space exploration often changes how we view ourselves and our place in the universe. But similarly, I think we should change how we view space exploration. As an example, how many of you are familiar with this image? Good number of you. OK, this is from Apollo 8. And how many of you are familiar with this image? A good number of you. Awesome. Space Geeks here. Yay. Um, so this is uh, an image that was taken by Hubble in 1995 um, of the Eagle Nebula. And what both of these images have in common, obviously, is that we're very familiar with them. We've grown up seeing them and, and seeing them at our schools and various places online. But that's really all we've ever done with them. We've just seen them. We haven't really been able to tinker with the data behind them or really interact with them much. And so when I talk about hacking space exploration, I'm really talking about hacking space observation, because that's really the relationship that we have with space exploration. We're often watching government agencies and other people exploring space on behalf of us, but we ourselves aren't really doing much more than observing. So there's a few reasons for why that is, one of which is that in 1969, we had a fairly historical event. We sent a man to the moon. But also in 1969, possibly a less historical event, we sent the first message over ARPANET, the early form of the internet. That message was LO for login. And unfortunately, the computer crashed shortly thereafter. <laughs> but that said, with about 40 years of hindsight, which one of these events has had a greater impact on us? Well, the internet is now millions and millions and close to 2 billion users. And yet, with 50 years of space exploration behind us, only a little more than 500 people have actually ever been in space. This, to me, is incredibly sad and broken. And so when you look at all those images uh, from NASA <laughs> that we've grown up with, uh, they're not actually that open. But what if space exploration was open? That's a question that a couple of years ago, myself, Jane McGonigal, and the Institute for the Future, a really cool nonprofit uh, based out of Palo Alto, asked. We asked, what will you do when space is as cheap and accessible as the web is today? So if you could imagine owning a Cube satellite, which you can see here, for about the price of an iPod, how would that change us? So we asked people to forecast how it would change us positively and negatively, and people answered about how it would change our psychology and how it would change our environment. But one of the most fascinating responses, I thought, was that people thought it would create a citizen science renaissance. That simply having access to space exploration, similar like we do the web, would actually inspire people to actively contribute to science and space exploration. And this is because doing something changes how you see it. So act Actively being able to do science and space exploration changes your relationship with it from something of observation to something that you're actively exploring and participating in. And this actually relates to my personal story. Because back in 2008, I was watching an awesome documentary called When We Left Earth on the Discovery Channel. If you haven't seen this, I really recommend it. It documents the Apollo missions and just NASA in general. And I found this documentary so incredibly inspiring that I decided I wanted to work at NASA. And so I sent them a shot in the dark email saying that I was a massive fan of everything they did. And if they ever needed a volunteer, I was here. Um, it was a total geek fangirl moment. And I had no idea if they would ever need someone like me, because I have no formal science background whatsoever. My degree is in print graphic design, and I had been working at an ad agency for a while. So I was just like, hey, if you need me, I'm here. Um, Serendipitously, I was able to get a job based off of that email. And so I got to work at NASA, which was this incredibly inspiring experience I had never expected. And I got to learn from scientists about 
dark matter and robots and all these amazing things. It was like getting paid to go to school. But one of the most important things I ended up learning while I was at NASA was that I didn't need to be an astronaut in order to explore space. Not only did I end up learning that I didn't need to be an astronaut to explore space, but I ended up learning that I didn't even need to be at NASA to explore space. And so I left. But, but this is what a lot of people are realizing, is that you shouldn't have to be one of the lucky few. <laughs> you shouldn't have to be one of the lucky few who works at NASA in order to explore space. Like the Tron guy who wants Tron to become a reality now, we want space exploration to become a reality now. We don't want it to be science fiction. We don't want to look like dorks by asking for it. It should be real. But hacking space exploration goes one step beyond the sort of instructables DIY culture of, you know, maybe how to make your super shiny space leggings. They look very fashionable, but I, I bet they're probably not very functional in space. Um, so it's not exactly the sort of DIY, do it in your own backyard just for the fun of it. And it's also not about being a hipster wearing a t-shirt saying that this was supposed to be the future and where's my jetpack? It's not about complaining about things. It's about saying, you know what? I have no idea how to build a robot, but I'm going to be damned if I'll let that keep me from sending stuff into space. <laughs> and that's exactly what 11 and 13 year old kids in the UK did. This isn't Photoshop, this is a real image here of <laughs> teddy bears in space. They partnered with... <laughs> they they partnered with the University of Cambridge and uh, sent their teddy bears into space because they wanted to test how different materials reacted in high altitudes. So hacking science and hacking space exploration isn't just about getting excited and making things. It's about getting excited and making disruptively accessible things. Things that really disrupt the current state of science and a lot of the elitism that has grown up around it and really make it accessible for everyone so that people can send teddy bears into space if they so please. So a perfect project that's an example of that is a project called Galaxy Zoo, which you can go to galaxyzoo.org to check it out. And Galaxy Zoo got started because a student was tasked with classifying 50,000 galaxies on his own. Quite a lot. And needless to say, he got a bit tired of it and started asking if there was a more efficient way to get this done. And this is a problem that a lot of people are facing because we have a lot of unprocessed interstellar stuff we're able to take in more and more data, but we still need to analyze it on a human level because robots, unfortunately, are still a little bit dumb. So this is what Galaxy Zoo looks like. It's a really simple interface where people can classify and potentially even discover new galaxies that have never been discovered before. And it's a really simple image. It's uh, an image of a galaxy, and it asks you a few basic questions uh, that's uh, at a fairly low learning curve. It asks you, how smooth the galaxy is, does it have any spiral arms, really simple things. And this all uses open data that's all out there from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. But the thing that makes Galaxy Zoo really awesome is that they don't believe in data monkeys. That if you discover a galaxy on Galaxy Zoo, your name goes on that scientific paper for discovering it. So this isn't some sort of mechanical Turk operation where you're doing work and some scientist is going to take credit for it. The work you do on Galaxy Zoo actually gets credited to you. And a perfect example of that is the Green Peas Galaxies. The Green Peas Galaxies were entirely discovered by Galaxy Zoo members. And this is because not only does Galaxy Zoo give you an Im a pretty image of a galaxy, but they also allow you to dig into the data behind it. So if something looks a little bit peculiar, you can actually investigate the data. And that's exactly what happened with the Greenpeace galaxies. And soon after, you had people with science backgrounds and people without science backgrounds collaborating in the forums to try and figure out what these were. And they ended up being uh, one of the most efficient star formation galaxies that have been discovered to date. And of course, all of this leads to better machine learning so that the robots can hopefully catch up to us uh, and not overtake us, but uh, help us look for galaxies. 
So if you're intrigued about how you can actively collaborate and actively contribute to space exploration, there's a lot of these types of projects on a site called spacehack.org, which is a site that I created when I left NASA. And spacehack.org is essentially just a directory of ways to participate in space exploration. I had heard about all of these great projects, but no one really knew about them, so I compiled them all into this page. So there's really great projects in addition to Galaxy Zoo. There's things like mapping dark matter, where you can uh, try and make algorithms that measure dark matter better than the current algorithms. There's projects like Google Lunar X Prize, where you can join a team that's sending a robot to the moon in the next few years. There's projects like the TubeSat kit, where you can build and launch your own satellite for $8,000, which is pretty awesome. So all of that's on spacehack.org. So all of these projects follow a few modes of invading space. Um, they're all about open collaboration and disruptive accessibility, so really having people from a diverse set of different backgrounds coming together to collaborate. So this isn't just for scientists, this isn't just for developers, this, this is for all different types of people. And it's really about active contribution. So it's not something where you're at replying NASA on Twitter and hopefully maybe they'll read it and be inspired by what you say. This is something where you're actively contributing to scientific discovery. And the last point I want to spend a little bit of extra time on is the idea that open doesn't mean accessible. And this is because there already is a lot of open and available scientific data out there. But it's either buried deep within a government website or it's very difficult to understand. So it's really not that accessible. And it's really sad that people aren't thinking of ways to make it more accessible. Because if you think about that Galaxy Zoo project, that data was already out there. But it wasn't until someone came around and built an interface to it that it allowed hundreds of thousands of people to be able to classify and discover galaxies. They have over 400,000 users now. It's amazing. So born out of this frustration that there's not enough accessible scientific and space-related stuff out there, came an event called Science Hack Day. And Science Hack Day is essentially an event where scientists, developers, designers, and generally just people with good ideas come together in the same physical space for a weekend to see what awesome things they can build. And so amazing things come out of this, because not only are people coming to learn about science, but they're coming to make science more accessible. And that's something you can do with or without a formal science background. And so from Science Hack Day, there was one in San Francisco and there was one in London. And these are some hacks from the San Francisco one. People made uh, high altitude balloon hacks uh, that could map the Earth below. People made uh, lamps that would light up every time a near Earth object passed by. So you could get like a little lamp of death <laughs> every time we... <laughs> every time we missed an asteroid. Uh, the person who built that's actually at OSCON, and, and I think we'll be speaking. His name's Nathan Berge. Um, and then also people made uh, a concept for a particle wind chime. And so it took data from a particle accelerator and mapped it to sounds. So if you could imagine what a particle collision might sound like instead of a visualization of it, that's what they did. And that's actually being considered as a diagnostic tool, an augmented diagnostic tool for a particle accelerator laboratory. So that's pretty awesome. Of course, there were tons of robotics projects. Of course, of course. <laughs> and there was a, a project that uh, was a concept for a DNA tie. And they prototyped using Arduino to uh, have a tie that would light up in your individual DNA sequence, depending on who wore it. So a bunch of really awesome things come out of Science Hack Day. And I have two exciting announcements uh, today about Science Hack Day, is that to coincide with OSCON, we have open sourced the instructions for how you can create a Science Hack Day in your own city. Um, in addition to open sourcing these instructions, we've also uh, gotten a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to send 10 people who are interested in organizing a Science Hack Day in their city from around the world to attend Science Hack Day San Francisco this year in November. So I'm really excited about that. And so with that, it's really my dream for all of, all of us here at OSCON to not only get excited and make things, but to really get excited and make disruptively accessible, awesome, amazing ways of contributing to and interacting with science and space exploration. Thank you.